while ago, you remember me talking about a company called Seedball, who, with the aid of their product, are helping to attract a variety of wildlife into our gardens. And on the phone now, we have uh, one of the co-founders of Seedball, Anna Attlee. Anna, good morning. Good morning, Abby. How are you doing? Fine. Nice to hear from you. Yeah, it's a lovely day for it. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> the day that I want to be out in my garden, in fact. Yeah, I know what you feel exactly the same way. <laughs> Instead of in the office. But it's fine, <laughs> that's okay, I'm talking to you. It's lovely. Well, maybe we could start with where the idea of Seedball came from and how you got it all started. Well, yeah, so basically, Seedball started out life. Um, I was an academic, Emily and the co founder, my co founder, um, doing PhDs in conservation at the University of Aberdeen. Mm hmm trying to save the world, trying to make a difference. Um, we thought the way to do that would be writing papers, you know, <laughs> academic papers. Yes. Um, unfortunately, nobody really read those. So, oh. Oh, well. <laughs> so we were like, well, maybe the next way forward would be to, to be a, doing a project. Um, and we went on some business training. And the business training we did was actually um, NERC, which is the National Environment Research Council. I don't know if you've heard of them. I haven't. Oh, well, they're a massive funding body for um, environmental sciences. Right. And they have this program where they pick out people to come along. They invite you to come and do some business training. Okay. It's like a mini MBA. Um, and the idea is to inspire us to kind of be um, a nation of, of, of um, producers of knowledge. So it's kind of t taking that and turning that into business, and that would help our economy. So at the time, that was their idea. I see. Um, so myself and Emily and also Gina, who I think you've been in contact with before, who runs our social media. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we were all on this course together, um, learning how to be businesswomen. <laughs> so we did this course, and basically in that course, they tell you, start with a problem that you would like to solve, and then build your business around that. Um, and we actually had a slightly different problem for that, that mini MBA. But afterwards, we were like, you know what? Everything that we want to do is to make a difference in the world. And um, we were very passionate about um, wanting to help bees. Obviously, I don't, you, I don't know if you know much about the plight of the bees, the fact that the numbers are declining. It's, it's getting pretty grim for bees, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very grim. And at the time, it was starting to hit the news. There was starting to be... Uh, more knowledge around it. I've done a project, um, an academic project with uh, Professor Mark Reed, um, with the government, with BESPRA, actually, on how we could help um, increase bee numbers and help the bees. And part of that was the bees don't actually have enough food. <laughs> so even if we had lots more beekeeping, we did more to, to get these in, we actually, they don't have enough food and is one of the major things. Um, and lots of our gardens at the time were just essentially filled with um, flowers that just had nothing for bees to feed from. So essentially just like planting plastic in your garden. Yeah. You know, and, and there were, it was the time that there was a little bit of rumbling about pollinator-friendly um, flowers coming up. So about six, seven years ago, I suppose, that the idea started around this point. Um, and I'd just done I, some research on national parks and the impact they would have, and I came across this statistic that the UK garden, if we combine just the garden space alone, that's more of an area than all of the um, nature reserves in the UK combined. Wow, it can make a difference. Well, it, it, yeah, and this light bulb moment just sort of happened where I was like, well, wow, you know, that they're not even taking into account the balconies that we have, um, the, the vertical wall space that we have, hanging baskets, you know, window boxes, they're not even taking into account that. Mm. So, you know, what if we just did one tiny thing? If, if there was a tiny tweak and we planted for bees in our gardens and the gardens are all connected, you actually could save the bees. I mean, it, it was such a simple kind of concept. Um, and essentially, we just needed people to grow more wildflowers. I don't know if you have you tried to grow wildflowers. It's not an easy task. No, I failed miserably. <laughs> every time, every time I wanted to try and grow them, so I tried, I don't know how, what techniques you've managed to try. Just putting seeds in the ground and water them and putting some uh, compost in and hoping. Yeah, yeah, no, that's essentially what I was doing. So, yeah, my, my experiments kind of started off with throw out some seeds and see what happened. And, of course, you know, nothing really happened. And they were all 
decent by the birds. So I provided nice feast for the birds, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried to propagate them in the um, greenhouse, but I'm really, I wasn't, uh, wasn't good enough. You know, there wasn't the time because I was trying to juggle my academic career with gardening and it just didn't work out. Um, so I came across this um, research by a guy called Masanobu Fukuoka. Probably said that really wrong. Um, but he did one straw revolution. It's an amazing farming technique where basically it's using seed balls. So it's the first time I come across the, uh, the concept of seed balls. His concept was to use grain and mix it with clay, essentially. The clay would protect it from birds, and they could just sort of throw that out into the field right. and without damaging the soil, you know, disturbing the soil and releasing the carbon that's stored in the soil. Yeah. So the revolution was basically, you know, you just needed a couple of men to, to create a whole massive farm instead of all this machinery, instead of all these people. Um, and it was just super inspiring. So I thought, you know, what if we could take this concept of the seed wrapped in something and start to apply that to our wildflowers? Because our wildflowers, they're difficult to grow. You know, the birds will take them, but they're also really slow to germinate. So they kind of need that protection before, whilst they get going. They need the protection of the clay to stop the birds eating them. And they need kind of a little bit of extra, so we added in extra actually as we went along, to stop the slugs and snails getting them. <laughs> and they're a little shoot. So this is your product you, you produce now, is it, this seed ball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, we came, we um, did through lots of experimentation. So at one point, you know, the whole of, um, I had the whole of my garden, balcony, everything filled with pots, different experimental pots going on. With different recipes related to the seed ball concepts and how we could make growing wildflowers easy so that you could literally get anybody in the UK, the world, to just throw out seed that's packaged appropriately and get wildflowers to come up. It's so as simple it's as that, is it? As simple as that. Simple as that, yeah. So that's all I was trying to get to. Eventually, we added in compost to kind of give the a bit of head start, some chili powder to stop slugs and snails eating them, and yeah, so that's where it came from, just really that idea of we need to save the bees. They really need help. Our gardens are the place definitely to be doing that. Um, and not, I don't need, you don't need a garden. I'm going to reiterate, as, you know, as the balconies, the window boxes, hanging baskets, anything like that. And you don't need to be a gardener. So basically we didn't want to have a product that meant that you needed to know how to garden. So anybody can plant these seeds. And are they suitable for any soil? Yeah. So another thing that I looked at, was um, imagine the concept of standing in the middle of your garden and you were able to just throw a mixed bunch of seeds in the air and then let nature choose, you okay. know? Yeah. So the, in the shady spots, shady plants will grow, sun-loving plants will grow in the sun-loving spots, etc., etc. So we took that concept and we got a nice group of flowers that work well together so that you could literally do that just with the seed ball. Stand in the middle of your garden, throw it. Foxgloves will bloom in the shady area. Are you going to have oxide daisies loving the sun in the sunny area? And you don't need to think about it. You don't need to know. You just let na nature decide which of those seeds are going to dominate in that area. And these seed balls, of course, will benefit not just the, uh, the bee population, will they? They'll go further than that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, I think, you know, these are kind of like the, they were our flagship ship. Um, in fact, our um, what we started off with, but of course it's any pollinator, um, and we have a butterfly mix, so we, we have them tailored to specific animals, but essentially they, anything will benefit. So the more insects that you bring into your garden, the suddenly the more birds you're bringing in that are going to feed on those insects, and bats, we've got a bat mix now, so wow. <laughs> you know that you're really like adding into the chain, and it all starts with that bottom layer of increasing insect abundance in our urban areas, in our gardens, everywhere that we can, will then just have that massive knock-on effect into the food chain. So it's literally like a snowball effect, isn't it? You start with planting, it builds up from there. Exactly. And it's, like, it's the smallest thing. It's, it's, we started with thinking, what, what is the tiniest, smallest thing that we can do that's the easiest thing that people can do to have the hugest impact? Um, and it, sometimes it just sounds a little bit too simple, you know, just just grow wildflowers, poof, and save the world. But literally, that, that can happen because we, are, we can have such a massive impact on the food chain by just adding that bottom layer in.
When you think about it, years ago, meadows were the thing that were keeping the insect population and the wildlife, of course, going, wasn't it? So it's basically it's like a mini meadow, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, we don't, I mean, we don't really see meadows in the same way, you know. It's, a lot of our intensive farming kind of got rid of those, and all of those insect populations that were there, I mean, where are they now? They, they get pushed to the margins, often to our road verges, where we have um, kind of our remnant meadows. Um, and those verges often link to towns, and so we can have that kind of, there is really a push to margin population of our insects, and we, what we used to have isn't there. I mean, we've lost 97% of our wildflowers, you know, in the UK. It's, it's mad. That's a lot of flowers, isn't that, lost? It, yeah, and, and the, the thought of how we bring that back um, is something that drives us, you know, at Seedball, just you know, it's, it's more than a business. It's, it's kind of a research project. It's kind of a, well, we're a non-profit as well. So our aim is literally to save the bees, to get more wildflowers out there. Um, yeah, and, and restoring that 97% is something that we're super passionate about. Mm. Let's move on, <coughs> excuse me, let's move on to sort of wildlife gardens in general. Um, Anna, would you say that like, gardening for wildlife nowadays is probably more important than it's ever been before? The lack of meadows that we have out there, the increased urbanization, I mean, these are just facts of life. You know, that's, our population is growing, um, and we are unfortunately mowing too much at the wrong time of year. So yeah. we need to be looking at our gardens, looking at what we've got control over to help save wildlife more than ever because of that intensification, because of that greater urbanization what we actually have around us, whether that's our garden, it doesn't have to be your garden even. You're, if you've got um, the school that you're working with, your children's school, for example, they're quite happy to put in a little plot for wildlife. Um, and any community kind of centres will do, so it's not, not just our gardens, but it's becoming more and more important that we take control of what we possibly can yeah. and we can create our own nature reserves. And those nature reserves are not to be underestimated. It's massive. What a small area of land, how many insects, that can support. That's right. I mean, as you said, any size wildlife garden, if you add up, if only a quarter of the country did that, you've still got a massive nature reserve, haven't you? Put them all together. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it just goes back to that figure of the fact that all of our gardens combined is more than all of the national nature reserves. So we really don't need to do that much to have the impact of one huge nature reserve. Um, and it doesn't need that many of us to do that much at all. And lots of the things that you can do to help wildlife are really, really simple. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of what we try and look at is what are the simple quick wins. So putting in a pond. But it doesn't have to be a pond, just the washing up bowl is fine. But, you know, put some rocks in so that the bees can feed and not, not get stuck in your pond. You know, there are small things that you can do all the time that can make a huge difference. Leave, in, leave your garden untidy. Don't mow your lawn. You know, that's quite a winner. Um, I also say, you know, if, if you're fond of a, of a summer beverage, then stick with cider because we have apple trees just supporting the orchards, which then support the bees. So, you know, there's lots of little things that you can do that don't cost us, in fact, much or anything. Or change, they're not massive tweaks to our lifestyle. This is the thing, isn't it? Wildlife garden doesn't have to be expensive. It can be done very, very cheaply, really, can't it? And still make a massive difference to the local wildlife in your area. 100%. You know, don't, don't mow your lawn as much. Or leave little paths through your lawn. So, you know, if your neighbours, if you're concerned your neighbours think you're being super untidy, then make it look like it's meant to be. Um, a little log pile in the corner is a huge difference for wildlife. Um, like I said, just a dish with some water, something that you can, that, that's perfect for bees, a little bee pond, if you can't put in a bigger pond. Um, so many different things. If you can put in vertical, lots of climbers, if you've got space for climbers, bog those in. But... Much of these things are just literally leaving nature to be a little bit messy. So don't be so tidy and just leave it to do its own thing. We can really have a big difference for not much money at all. This is the thing now that I find out with gardens. People are very tidy with their gardens. And, you know, gardens are designed for people. And, you know, they keep the grass cut short and people have patios. And um, even now we have fake grass. So... Um, a, a slightly tidy, untidy area in a garden can really make a difference. So if you want a tidy garden, just have one corner that can be slightly untidy for the wildlife. 100%. Just one little bit. And if you're concerned like what, what people think, then make it look really obvious. Put a sign up, say this is my wildlife corner. You know, 
it's some things that you can do are really simple. I mean, you're super into hedgehogs, are you? So it could be like cut a hole in your head, in your fence. Yes, never so, into hedgehogs. Yeah, so we can connect our... Because the hedgehogs have that massive um, area that they cover, so literally connecting with your other gardens can have a big difference. Yes, what are life corridors yeah, around for exactly. Yeah, Where you cut a hole in a fence, your neighbour cuts a hole in their fence, the hedgehogs need about five gardens at least to find enough food to survive. So, yes, how would your neighbours try and get a hedgehog corridor going? That can really help the hedgehog population, which, as you know as much as I do, are struggling as well. Yep, yeah, it's a quick win. A quick win that's not going to make your... That makes your garden a wildlife garden, essentially, is you're just literally making wildlife welcome. And a small hole in your fence makes just no difference. Nobody will see it. A little log pile in the corner is not a big deal. And a patch of wildflowers always looks totally beautiful, but I am, of course, very biased. Well, it's nice because you can attract butterflies that you might not otherwise see as well. I mean, we had it with our wildlife garden. We've got all kinds of butterflies in the garden now before we didn't get any at all. And it's very quick. Nature's very quick to move into an area that it needs and it can find. It's so true. You know, if you do such a, something that I found very rewarding about this is that you can have this totally barren garden. I mean, if you look on our Twitter feed, there's quite a few people that have showed us their, their gardens before that are just, you know, very barren, very normal, just, just grass. They've scattered some wildflowers, and the next year you've just got this abundance of bees and butterflies and, you know, birds come in. Everything will recolonize. Everything will come back if we make just that small little effort. And, it, yeah, it's such a reward. Just been one of my nicest... You know, my best moment is to sit there on a morning with a cup of coffee and watch the butterflies and bees buzzing around the meadow. It is very satisfying when you get one. I've gone, I agree, I've sit out in my garden. Um, we've had jays come in recently, green finches, which I haven't oh. seen for years. So it's very progressive, and you don't know what you're going to get next. It really, you really have opened up a huge area to wildlife, and it's, you can be quite surprised at what you can find visiting your area. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we started off the ball in London, in North London, um, and obviously the whole place is filled with wildflowers, as you can imagine. They're hanging baskets, balcony pots, everything. Yeah. And I remember just coming out one evening and looking up, and there was suddenly pipistrelle bats flying around the balcony. Oh, lovely. I just couldn't believe it. It was amazing. You know, having moved from Scotland, where we just had this natural wilderness and abundance, to London, I was nervous. And then all of a sudden, no, it doesn't. You build it, they'll come. Yeah, and of course not just the daytime wildlife, as we found out, because moths, of course, also benefit from things like honeysuckle and badlia, um, the, the scents given off at night, and that, so you're yeah. helping the, the moth population as well. Yeah, well, the, if you, you're thinking towards like more um, white flowers, things like that, that really does bring in the moths at night. And we, we have um, our bat mix that we've just launched is actually a lot of flowers to attract moths, obviously, because then the moths bring in the bats. Yeah. So yeah. it's an unfortunate moss mix. Because <laughs> the problem now, there's a lot of housing don't allow for wildlife, um, although there is a housing association near where we are that are now starting to put in bat boxes and swift boxes. Um, but where we are, that hasn't been done. And so wildlife needs as much help as it can get from the occupier because sometimes the housing development, people don't think about these things. Exactly. It's really interesting. I mean, I've come across a number of sort of innovations in buildings that, that could be added in um, after building or during the building process to help wildlife and I hope that I hope that's a trend that, that continues um, but otherwise things like you know your, you said your lace local bat group we contacted them at Seedball HQ and they came and put in some bat boxes for us for free just in the back garden it was amazing yeah if people want to some advice Hannah on starting up their own wildlife garden where can they go for that um, so, for me, I'm finding I like to look at the Wildlife Trust and the things that are happening under the 30 Days Wild at the moment. I think that's amazing. And the RSPB, um, Make Wildlife Welcome, if you just Google that, that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we have a Wildlife Gardening Week that occurs later in the year. So, if you're connected to social media, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, search those hashtags, 30 Days Wild, Make Wildlife Welcome. Um, and Wildlife Gardening Week, and they'll give you lots of inspiration. Um, on our own page, if you have a link to our Pinterest page, mm -hmm. um, that has lots of very cool projects that you can do and just ideas for quick-win wildlife gardening. 
whether it's having making your own bee saver kit when you're out and about, which is just simply a little bit of sugar water to keep with you if you see yeah. a tired bee, or um, how to make a hedgehog box. We've got oh, that yes. on our Pinterest page. We've got that kind of linked in via our website. So, yeah, pop, pop along. And we try and connect everything. Cause, you know, our main aim is literally to get more people to help wildlife. So on our own Twitter page, we often link to really cool projects that are going on and have that bit of conversation there. And the thing to emphasise is that anybody can have a wildlife garden, even if they think, oh, I haven't got a big enough garden for that sort of thing. Anybody can do this, can't they? Absolutely. We have um, one of our projects I've got, I've put it up onto our YouTube page, people YouTube, was literally we made a vertical wall with baked bean cans, so old baked bean cans. Okay. It's very, very simple. can do it now. Keep them when you have them. Um, punch some holes in the bottom if you want the drainage. Otherwise, you know, you don't necessarily need to. We painted them and we made them pretty, filled them with soil and popped one seed ball in the top and then we hung them from the wall. You can also just, you know, hammer, put a little nail in your wall and hang them by string. And we had a whole wall of those going. Um, and so literally a vertical meadow. Now that's what I call recycling. <laughs> yeah, a bit of upcycling. And, and it, it's worth keeping. It's really, really... A nice project, nice project to do if you're, um, you know, a leader of cubs or guides or scouts or schools or stuff. Something nice for the kids to do, um, but very rewarding. So it's really pretty. That's what I was going to say, you know, get the kids involved in this and they'll get this love of Ireland. It'll be wonderful for them, won't it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research. I mean, going back to academia, there's a lot of research out there that says if you can kind of start these ideas young, involve children in growing, in nature at a young age, then they are going to carry that with them throughout their whole life. They're going to want to continue being, you know, eco-friendly and helping wildlife. And they're the future for wildlife, aren't they? So. Well, absolutely. We need them to grow up and want to fight for our buildings to be eco-friendly, fight for, you know, the road verges to be mowed in accordance to how wildflowers grow. You know, we need them to speak up for wildlife because if we don't speak up for wildlife, nobody else will. Well, exactly, as I've often said, it hasn't got its own voice. We have to be the voice for wildlife, don't we? Yes, exactly. What we, we do what we can. You know, I always encourage people to, um, to connect with other campaigns that they can do, to put their name to um, petitions, for example. So the Plant Life has a really good one about this mowing of wild, wildflower road verges, which you can connect to. Um, but then if you don't even have the time to do that, it's doing your own little bit. So anybody with any space whatsoever, even if you've got... So occasionally we get um, asked about um, roof gardens being very high up. Are they too high for people mm. to do something? No, it's a case of build it and they'll come. You'll be amazed. We've had in Crouch End in London a project that was on the roof of a supermarket. Um, and that was growing food, it was called Food from the Sky. Mm. And wildflowers, and it's literally abundant with butterflies and bees. It was, and it's amazing what wow. you can do. But it doesn't matter if you're in the highest block of flats. Now, if people want to find out about Seedball and the products that you produce, how do they contact you? Uh, if they go to um, www.seedball.co.uk, that's our website, so they can have a look there. And it links to our social media for people who want to connect in that way. Um, we're usually at seed underscore ball. And that's, we're across the board. We just really like to connect with people. So pop us a, a tweet email us, message us, anything, anything that you're connected with, we want to be connected with so that we can continue these kind of conversations. Yeah. As a final question, then, Hannah, uh, what are the future plans for Seedball? So we have, um, I suppose that's, in a way, I can kind of conceptualise it two ways. There's the business, what's the next thing in the business? Mm -hmm. um, and it will be to continue expanding the range that we've got. So we've moved from our initial bees and butterflies through collaborating with um, the Natural History Museum on the latest range for bats and birds and beetles. Um, we'd like to take that more across Europe, then start to go to different countries and expand um, mixes for them and just continue to make this kind of simple gardening accessible across the globe. Um, and then from a kind of the dream of Seedball, I mean, the reason Emily and I actually started Seedball, you know, is to make that first difference. Um, and it's a non-profit. So what we're doing behind the scenes is actually saving up to buy land to create our own uh, meadow nature reserve. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, really hopeful that within 
this year, end of this year, next year, we're going to start to see those those little meadow nature reserves start to be bought by Seedball. So actually, uh, that's what I'm really excited about. I'm excited to see the fruition of the business that's created really to save nature and that, that actually coming to fruition. Hannah, it's been lovely talking to you. Before, Thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed it. I hope people um, are interested in wildlife guiding more than they were before yeah. we started the conversation. And before you go, you've chosen a song to play it with, haven't you? What is it? I have chosen an old one but a good one, which is All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. Because that's all you need. A little bit of love and a seed ball. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> Hannah, thank you very much indeed. You too. Thanks. That was Hannah Adley from Seedball. And uh, do take a look at the website. Well worth having a look.